Hi, BookTube. It's Jackie from Jackie's Literary Corner. And once again, I'm off. I'm going to be off a lot more this week. Because I worked like three. I volunteered three, um, for three days in a row. Well, not in a row. Actually, like, there's one day and then I had a little bit of a break. And then two days in a row. And then I had to go to work the next day anyway. And I'll have to remember this time that if they call me to say I can't work because my mom is still planning on going to Virginia to help my sister out now that she's a newborn. And I'm so jealous. I wish I could go with her. In fact, the other day when we when we were talking about it, well, we were, we got, we finally, my mom finally reserved a time at the pool because now with this whole pandemic, they have the pool open, but you have to reserve when you want to go. So during one of those, one of, during one of those visits, we were talking about it. And my dad just teasingly mentioned that I've said it three times and that's not going to magically change it. So I think unconscious, as much as I hate to admit, I think unconsciously saying that I kind of, part of me was saying it more than once to get the message across that I want to go. And although, I mean, it's also, it's not just that I'm thinking, because I know that deep down, it's not like magically I'm going to be able to go. I can't, with my job and everything, it's hard for me to be able to go and, my job combined with this whole pandemic going on, it's a little too risky for me to go, and I can't just ask off all the time. But it was also partly not just because I was magically hoping that somehow someone would tell me, oh, you actually can go. Um, I think it was also just, I wanted to put it out there. I wanted to make sure they heard, and like they didn't respond the first two times. But um, anyway... So my mom, so my mom like doesn't want me to go to work too much because I'm in an environment where it's a little risky. Just you know, but I am trying to give myself keep myself distracted by like TV shows and reading and stuff like that, and then of course BookTube, and still obsessively watching over my watching my favorite scene in episode two eighteen of Charm the reboot, which is when my couple my ship finally gets together. And even playing out scenes in my head, because even playing out the scenes in my head, because I've told you guys, I mentioned before that that's what I, I like to do, is, you know, either, like, I play it out in my head, because I'm, like, I get, like, a little self-con- self-conscious when I try to write it out, because even if it's just something that I'm only going to see, I still am like, all these questions of, am I doing this right? Do I really know the characters? Would they really say this? Or am I projecting myself on the characters and what I would say in the situation? And then when I do, like, and, like, so I like writing intimate scenes, so it gets secondhand embarrassment, but, um, so anyway, as far as the reading, I am working on, well, I just finished this one, and I'm still working on this one, and this one, this one was kind of inspired by the fact that it's July, and July 4th was Independence Day when we gained our independence and the declaration was written, um, so... For inspiration of that, since I wasn't going to see any fireworks, I decided to attempt to read this again. Which, I'm, I'm interested in the topic of John Adams and the American Revolution, but it can seem dry at times, and I have to be in the right mood for it. And I'm also watch, I also started to watch continue watching season two, and one of the good things, I know that some people would disagree, because even Terry herself prefers 22 episode arcs. Like, a lot of, you know, like, a lot of American shows would do that, but now a lot of the shows here in the U.S. are going with the 10-episode arc. And I personally, you know, I like both. Because 22 episodes is a lot of episodes, and there's room for a lot of filler episodes. Um, But 10 episodes, you know, you still get the basic story. No, not really any filler episodes. And the episodes can be longer. That was the other thing I found about mentioning to Terry if we got into the discussion again about which if 22 art to 10 episodes is better, I, I would point out that, well, 10 episodes mean you get longer episodes. Um, but this show, Turn, Watching the Skies, is the show I got into, I've gotten back into because in, inspired by the fact that this is July is... July 4th was the Independence Day. Um, I decided to get back into it, and it's only 10 episodes per season. So I'm almost done with season 2. I think I'm either in the last or the second to the last episode. I'm not sure. I can't remember how many episodes I watched last night, if I watched 2 or 3 episodes. 
it's but it's basically the whole um the spy ring that George Washington created during during the war so they could you know be kept up to date and he had spies in England that were spying on the government the British government um it, it's a it's really cool it's a, it's a really cool idea of like kind of learning about this and getting a fictionalized version of it and apparently, like, I was kind of surprised because Terry herself said that a lot of teenagers do like this. And she knows some people who role-play as the as the historical figure Lafayette, the guy from France. You learn a lot more about him in Hamilton, I think, in the, play, in the musical Hamilton. Because I don't think he comes until Elaine or maybe the last, either season three or four is when his character shows up, I think. Because I haven't gotten to his character. In fact, I was a little confused when she mentioned him and then I was like... You know, we talking about the same, and then she, re you know, she showed the screen image, and it turns out we were talking about the same show. And then I remembered, oh wait a second, there is a historical figure named Lafayette, Lafayette, and he's he becomes friends with Hamilton. But um, and I was a little like, part of me was a little like, okay, this is my special thing. I I don't want to, you know, I almost I get a little selfish about it. Like it's something that I I wanted, you know, I wanted to share with you. And that, but then, oh, I'm already aware, but I already watched it, you know, and I role play with someone, and my more petty self is like, it's my thing. I wanted to share it with you, you know, I wanted to introduce you to it. And, but anyway, um, that was me being childish and immature. <sighs> Not that I said that to her, but, you know, that was my immature thought, my childish, petty thought. Um, but it definitely, I think it definitely makes, I think the reason why a lot of younger people enjoy this, do enjoy it, is because it makes the history of the American Revolution more exciting and interesting for, like, in this one, of course, I think a lot of people like, you know, war dramatizations, because you get the best of both, you get the history lesson, but you also get the, the blood and the gore and the action and stuff, but this all mixed together in the intrigue um but it's a really it's on i think it's it ended in 2017 so it's on it has five seasons i believe um it's, it's really good and i you know it's kind of interesting i'm getting that side of things and then with this, this is the biography of John Adams, I'm getting the Congress side of, the government side of things. Like, we're seeing the Continental Congress getting together in, you know, through the eyes of John Adams, and getting how the Declaration of Independence was created, and how it was very frustrating for the people, especially Adams, because he wanted independence for America. But the, the Congress was divided. Like, some of them were more like, I would rather be not condemned for treason. And I wanted, you know, and we're like, and then there's some people who are not committing to a decision. So it provides, so you get, I've gotten in both sides of the story. And then Hamilton also covers the war as well. And I think it also covers the government side. Or actually it covers the war and then after the war we get, um, what comes on with Hamilton after the fact and his impact and how he was trying to get the Bank of America started. That's what, I think that's what Hamilton covers. Wow, like I said, this covers before the war. And then we, um, and then, and actually Hamilton does mention, talk about the Adams administration when Adams was president. And apparently, Adams, according to that musical, Adams and Hamilton kind of ruined their friendship by Adams calling out Hamilton on something, like criticizing him, and Hamilton found out, so he criticized them back. And that kind of ruined, I think that kind of ruined things. Um, so, of course, they kind of, I don't know how accurate or how much the, the musical exaggerates things. But anyway, um, but this, you know, so that one covers the war and after the war. And then this one covers um, before the war and what was going on behind the scenes and not on the battlefield. And then turn is all about what was going on the battlefield and the the people that were going undercover and maneuvering things and mastering you know and of course the show also covers the whole the trader you know Benedict Arnold and him 
she's switching sides, and, you know, it talks about him manip being manipulated by Peggy Shippen, who becomes his wife, and she was the lover of Andre something, I cannot remember his name, and we also, um, and then, so it's real, the American Revolution was really interesting, and in the long run, I should be just happy that a lot more people are getting interested in the American Revolution, whether they get it through reading nonfiction or a fictionalized version. It's, I think a lot of historians would be more pleased that people are actually being interested in this subject than just, like, even if it's just through entertainment, even if they're looked at in an entertaining lens, an entertainment lens. But, anyway, this is really good. And, I mean, it is a bit slow-moving, and, you know, it's a biography, so it can be kind of dry, all the, you know, but it's still very interesting if you are interested in the topic. And I'm up to the point where John Adams has gone together with the Congress and they're debating, and like I said, he's getting incredibly frustrated. And as I'm reading this, I keep thinking of, um, in, 19, in 1776, the musical, um, starring, like, the movie version starred William Daniels as John Adams, the guy who played Mr. Feeney on Boy Meets World, and then there was a revival of it starring Brett Spiner from Next Gen fame. He was John Adams. And in fact, when they did this play at my local community theater, my dad wanted to be John Adams, but they apparently said he was too tall for the role. But, um, and I think, and I think he, they said, though, he could be a Rutledge. He would be a good Rutledge. But I don't, but I think he, because, he, <laughs> but my dad, my dad kind of wanted to be John Adams, so we ended up not getting involved. But, um, Anyway, John Adams is such an interesting character. He's really smart. He's, although, from what I remember, he was not really good with, as far as, he was very affectionate to his wife, but he wasn't very, the, I think from what I've heard in the past, he wasn't very good, a very loving father. I mean, he loved his kids, but he wasn't, he was more formal with their, with the kids, I think. That's the impression I got from, but that was from the mini series with Paul Giamatti as John Adams. But anyway, um, so, like I said, we're at the part when he's in the Congress and he's kind of had a, he, and it's interesting, he liked Dickinson, Dickinson at first, the guy from, I think he's from Pennsylvania with Franklin, Ben Franklin, he liked him, but then, and respected him, but then they kind of, they had a falling out because he was, he's a Quaker, Dickinson is a Quaker, so he's more passive and doesn't want to, challenge England and he and like I said you know you, you can't entirely blame them for being a little reluctant because if they didn't if this failed if the American Revolution had failed then they would all be condemned for treason and we would still be under we would still be um we wouldn't exist America would not exist and these people would be committed for treason and get and be hung for it so it's very, it's interesting because it's like it's easy to judge those people who were like against challenging England and were afraid because we are a mo we are America exists now and we've come so far we're in the 2020 we're into year 2020 and so much has happened in like in the past cent couple centuries so it's easy for us to judge those people, but if you really think about it, it was kind of, you know, you gotta admire people like John Adams, but you also can't blame people like Dickinson, who were afraid and wanted a more peaceful resolution. You know? But like I said, it's easy to judge those people right now, being where we are now, and thinking, well, it's, you know, it's a good thing we listen to people like John Adams, because now, because America exists, and we are independent. And we've come so far in the world, but at the same time, like I said, it's, you can't entirely blame the others that were afraid, because who knows if, at this time, you they didn't know if they were going to succeed or not, and they were taking this huge risk. But, um, like, I really think John Adams' character, he's, he's such a character, he's, such, he's a very interesting man, and, you know, he's very smart. He, you know, and they even even said that he was so well, he was such a good writer that he could have been an actual writer. He could have been an author, 
instead of a politician or a lawyer. Because he writes so beautifully and he spoke so eloquently with his words and, you know, and he talks about how he doesn't think. He doesn't plan out what he's going to say because he feels like he wants to capture the emotion of what he's feeling when he's expressing his thoughts. Like, when he was doing, you know, when he was in Continental Congress and arguing for independence and making decision to be independent and fight back. But anyway, this is, if you like this, definitely check, you know, if you like learning about John Adams, Dan McCullough's biography is pretty good. Um, and then I finally finished this, I finished this one, which is a quick read. Um, The Magnificent Emersons, and apparently it's a trilogy. So I don't know if I'll ever get around to reading the other books, but I do. The impression I got from this book is, I mean, granted, I haven't read the other two books, but I wasn't lost or anything. I wasn't confused. You know, there are mentions of previous, you know, previous events in history and implied history about other characters in the story, but it, it wasn't like I was confused or anything. I still enjoyed the story. I still understood what was going on. Um... But this centers around this family, the Ambersons, and particularly Georgie Amberson, who was this young man who's, you know, his mother spoiled him, he's entitled, been his whole, entitled whole life. He's kind of a brat, which is so amusing, um, just to see him and his stubbornness and his pride and thinking he's so much better than everyone else. He keeps, like, if people are mean to him or criticize him, then... They're considered riffraff to him. He keeps, like, he uses that same term, riffraff, when he talks about people that he doesn't like or that don't like him or don't agree with his way of thinking. But, um, it's, he, his family is, the Ambersons are just this prominent family in this community and they practically own the community. So he's like, I'm George Amberson. I, so, what I say goes, and if I don't like something, then it, you know, then I'm gonna, like, if I, as long as I tell it to stop, it will stop. Like, so he just thinks that every, the whole world revolves around him, and the whole community just wants him to get his comeuppance, and it takes so long for him to get his, his comeuppance throughout the story. Like, it's not until close to the end when he finally gets it. Um, and he thinks his family will, you know run the world and they will always be around but then times are changing things are start to change and you know inventions are being created like the traffic light and the automobile and he is so you know he is so determined to believe oh the automobile will ruin us all and um and you could argue you know you could debate and argue if he's right or not you could argue that um but in the story, George, as a young man, he meets and falls in love with Lucy Morgan, who happens to be, it's her and her father. Her father is the guy who's working on inventing the automobile. And you find, he finds George, find, realizes that his fa Lucy's father and his mom, Isabel, have had a, hist a romantic history. Of course, he's, for most of this, for, you know, for a while, he's totally oblivious to this. But... He, at the same time, he doesn't like how intimate they seem to be when he, when Eugene Morgan comes into their lives. And it, like, it kind of upsets him. And he can't see the picture his mom as a woman, as a young girl. She's just his mom. And the idea of her having a life and having other relationships before his, before his father is unfathomable. It's impossible to believe. Um, and so... He is, you know, he wants to marry Lucy, and but she's she's hesitant to marry him. She doesn't want, she's like, you know, when they have been dating for a while, he's like, so are we engaged or what? And she's she keeps saying, almost, almost engaged. And finally he confronts her about it, and she says, I just have this queer feeling that we're not going to end up together in the end, so I don't want to risk getting my heart broken. So it's better if we just pretend to almost be engaged just to see what's going to happen. And of course, George was in his own little world, and he's like, oh, that's not going to happen. And this whole... And 
Eugene kind of impacts his life. They there is a bit of a rivalry between going on between them because he doesn't like how Eugene is getting close to his mom and feels Eugene is also threatening his relationship with Lucy because Lucy he feels like her father's influence in his way of living is impacting her decision to be with be with George. And it basically covers there this family's George Georgie Georgie's family's downfall and how they are from the old way of thinking and times are changing and people things are being invented and the world is their their small like simple little world is expanding and, and going beyond their little kind of their confinement they live in, their content lifestyle. Like all these people are coming like all these immigrants and stuff from different parts of the world, Jew Jews and Balkans and, you know, Romanians and from all over the world are coming and living in their community. And George just doesn't accept that things are changing. He cannot, he always believes things will be the way they are. I mean, and at one, like Lucy tries to be like, you know, tell him my, you know, that you should get a job. Because you you can't live the rest of your life as this uh, is aristocrat, where you don't do anything, you just chill and let other people take care of you, and you just rely on the money you you inherit. And he for the he resists that, and that's like he, that's part of her her father's way of thinking, and that's kind of what gets between them, and that is what gets between them. And um. And see, this is my problem. I end up stumbling. I, I'm never so eloquent. And I don't know how to edit my videos. I've never, and I don't have anyone that can help me. Someone would have to help me learn how to edit these videos. But anyway, so let's talk about the character, other than Georgie, um, who is such a, you know, you, he's pitiable, but he's also a frustrating and annoying character at the same time. And, and as some another reviewer pointed out, it's kind of laughable how stubborn he is. And how adamant he is against all these changes in his pride. How he thinks he's superior to everyone else. Like I said, he calls people riffraff if they criticize him or don't agree with him. They don't matter. And it's just, it's very, it's very amusing. But I think there are a lot of, there are people that are like George, I feel like. I feel like there's people that do exist. And then you have, like, people like his mom, Isabel, who... Is so loyal to him, and she's also frustrating too because it's like, how do you not see it? Your son is an incredibly flawed human being. You need to stop spoiling him, but she doesn't see it. And again, she's another character that I feel like does exist in real life. I believe there are mothers that will spoil their children and let them get away with stuff, and they grow up to be little brats. And of course, there's also the opposite problem where there's women that are needy and mo and smothering, and the kids, you know, want feel like they can't breathe, and they're become their mom's little baby, and they're like, "I'm not a baby. I'm a grown person." It's more so with boys than girls, I think. Um, although you can get a daddy's girl situation where the dad kind of. Not, no, I mean, obviously not the word smother, smother, but is very controlling and possessive of his, of his daughter. Um, and you, like, I feel like it's definitely a situation where they're both Georgie and his mom, Isabel, are at fault in this. Like, other people, a lot of people blame, a lot of people, like, Eugene kind of blames Georgie because at this point, he kind of controls his mom, and she will, she's very submissive to her son and gives him what he wants. And if he's not happy with the situation, then then she will give in. So he Eugene kind of blames George. It feels like George is at fault for the for Isabel resisting Eugene and giving him another chance. And then, but everyone else is like, no, it's Isabel's fault because she spoiled Georgie. So I feel like it's both their faults because she is started with her spoiling him and giving him what he wants and making him feel like he has the world at his fingertips and he can do it every one and he's superior to everybody else. She just let that get into his head that he was better than everybody else. But then afterwards, he like just, he made his own choices, his own decisions. But his mom is who shaped 
him to have those decisions. So it's a two-way street. But the problem is everybody looks with rose-colored glasses about the situation. I also like that it's during a time of change when the world is, society is changing and growing and like all these new inventions are coming to, to be like the invention of um, like the automobile and how it impacts Georgie's life and how this, the working, the rise of the working class and how people like the Amberson are going to eventually fall and they're no longer going to be relevant anymore. Which I think also Elizabeth Glass Gaskell covers that as well with her like North and South, which is the Industrial Revolution, and um, how in England factories were you know existed, and how these people were fighting the people that worked in factories were fighting for equal and fair pay and fair treatment, and the mill owners were trying to you know be like you know fighting back against that. Because they think that they are like, we own these factories, we own you kind of mentality. Um, so you look at the plight of both of that war between the factory work, workers and, the employ and their employers. And we get, the, we get the story of someone who's an outsider looking in from a different part of England, the, the other side of England, the south of England. Where you don't have the factories and stuff. She's from a farming the countryside. So she doesn't, you know, there's a little bit of it, but not, not a whole lot. And she sees from both sides. And she leans more heavily towards the workers and their plight. Because they're very sympathetic. And the rich factory owners aren't as sympathetic. And But at the same time, she forms the connection with one of the mill owners... An, like an intimate connection. So it's kind of a Pride and Prejudice thing a little bit. But that also covers that change. It's, I mean, obviously a different part of the world, and it's not, I don't think it's the same time period. I, I don't know, but, um, or maybe it's a little bit before this, before this takes place. Um, so it says this was published in 1918, and I assumed, oh, that's when this, this takes place, but it might be in the 1800s when this book when this is actually set. But, um, I really, I really hope more people, like, this is more, oh, no, no, that's 1873 is when, that's the period. I guess late 1800s into the early 1900s, I always, in my review I said the turn of the century. Um, and I think that's toward the end of the 1800s into the 19th, into the 20th century. Um, but I really hope more people get into this because I think this was a great book. It's one of my favorites so far of the year. Um, and I just hope more people check it out, you know, because I think it's really good. And it kind of gave me the same feels as The Great Gatsby did, where it was like, it was kind of sad, but sweet at times. Um, like more sad than anything, but very in, like very interesting. And these people trying to, and then you have some characters who are trying to recapture the past, just like Gatsby was trying to recapture the past. You know, trying to hold on to it and not let it, not let good let go of the good old days of the way things were before. And I feel like that's these characters are having trouble of letting go of the past and moving on from it, and it kind of hurts them in the end. It's also a very quick read. It's not, it's like 35 chapters, and they're not very long chapters. So it's definitely, it's from the modern library edition, by the way. So I feel like this is definitely an underrated one. I, this is my, I've never heard of this story, this novel before. Like, you know, no one's ever talked about it. It's not like an Austin or Dickens or Fitzgerald or Hemingway or something. Um, and I'm not, like, I didn't even recognize the name, Booth Tarkington. So. I just thought that the title was interesting and this cover of a chandelier was kind of cool. Um, and then I, you know, of course I read the back, so, and I liked that. I think it's a family saga, and I'm always a sucker for family saga stories. Um, but, if you, you know, I've never, I've never heard anyone talk about this book before. So I really hope people, you know, I hope this review helps and gets it more noticed by people. Even though I'm not the best reviewer, I feel like. Okay, so I'm working on those, um... 
and I'm still kind of on a classics kick right now. I mean, I feel like I want to get back into some fantasy soon, so, like, either read The Magicians or in, um, or just keep going with Nosfer Nosfer A2. Um, and then there's... Okay, I'm gonna put this in the book, because it'll probably fall anyway. Um... And I'm still, I started to read David Copperfield again, but it's going by slowly because, like I said, I worked a lot last week. And, um, so, and again, the only time I get to read is during, like, if, you know, my parents are, like, picking me up or during my 15-minute break and I only get through, like, a page or two. So, I need to read a lot about that, of that although I'm a little complaining because part of me feels like I need to read a little bit more of The Count of Monte Cristo. But, um, I am, as far as fantasy goes, if you guys can tell, I'm finally, I decided to read Strange the Dreamer, or listen to it on audiobook. Um, it's one of those ones, I, I, because I got Emma, I put Emma on hold on here, it will get, it will be available to me in six weeks. So I figured, let me start some other audiobooks. I went through all the audiobooks, and I decided, I saw this one was on there. As in, like, I looked for the books that were available now on audiobooks that I can get, like, that I don't have to wait a week or two to get them. Um, and this one, I went through them and this, I saw this one, so I decided, you know what, I'm gonna check it out. I hear it's really good and the writing is very beautiful. I like the writing so far. Um, although when I'm listening to it, sometimes I miss stuff because I listen to it when I'm taking, you know, I'm taking a shower. Or, you know, I decide to play it while I'm going through the book too because I want to finish it before my week is up. Because unfortunately the audiobooks you apparently only get a week. Which I think is silly. Because I think you need more I mean I like I said, my the only thing I can think of is the reason why they only give you a week is because they figure you'll listen to it all the time and you know, if you're in you know, most people drive at my at my age, so why listen to it in the car and and it's like, no, I don't. I read multiple books, I don't drive. I'm not going to listen to it when I go running, because I'd rather listen to music when I go running. Um, so it's like, I'm not I'm not going to listen to it all the time. There will be times when I won't be listening to it. So I try to find really good opportunities to listen to it, like I said, when I'm taking my shower. But the problem with that is sometimes I miss things because the water is loud. Um, and then sometimes I play it when I'm, you know, getting dressed or, make, you know, getting ready for getting myself together in the morning. Um, and then when I'm playing book, to, like when I'm watching book two videos, and I did increase the speed to 155. Um, to like just like speed it up, speed it up a little bit, and I'm like 40 percent, so that's not bad for when I I have like I think three days to turn this in. So I could hopefully I'll get a lot read, and I still haven't even you know I'm gonna go for my run. And when I get back, I just gotta remember to play on taking a shower. Um, and hopefully I'll get... Because I don't want to, like... I don't want to have to wait until I can get it back. I want to get it, like, now. I, I don't... I want to get done. I want to finish listening to it and not have to wait until the other... Until other people are done. Because then I might forget stuff. And I don't want to, like... And, you know, I can't buy every book that I want to read. I'm not going to buy every book I want to read. You know, if there are other alternatives, like getting it from the library or getting it on the audiobook via the Libby app, then I, I'll do that. I think my mom appreciates that. Um, I believe she saw my shelf. She can tell there's a lot of books that the pages are out and the spines, you cannot see the spines, and those are books that I have unread. So my mom saw that and was like, oh, you have a lot of books you haven't read. You know, it's like, even though it's not like she controls, you know, what I buy and stuff, but she still can make me feel a little guilty and a little bad if there's a lot I have around and I keep buying more books. It's the problem with living at home. Your parents still will have an opinion about things you do. So I'm trying, I keep trying to set rules for myself, but I did kind of break it a little bit. Like, I was going to say, oh, I'll get through three or four books read, um, and I've only gotten, like, three, I think, read and finished. Um, so I need one more, but then I kind of caved and decided to get a, go ahead and make a purchase from, my first purchase from Thrift Books. Now, unlike some, some of the other 
online used bookstores. There's no coupon code or anything that I can give you guys. Um, I mean, they gave me a coupon code, but not. It's not like one of those like where I have a specific one. They just decide. They just. I think Thrift Books will just give you one so that you can, you know, to go with your purchase. So you get 15% off of your first attempt, um, your first purchase. And there's all, and what I know, what I really like, I feel, I don't know if other used bookstores online do this, but they do give, you do get a sort of credit to where you, if you order the enough amount of books, then you'll get, you'll get a free book eventually. So, which is really cool. But anyway, um, I can't really, the only, like, I guess what's going on in this one is that our main character, Laz, well, li, ah, our main character, Laszlo, has been, he, um, is getting the opportunity to go to the mysterious city of Wheat that has disappeared from everybody's memory, and he's, but he's considered just a librarian and a storyteller, nothing special, but the guy who's kind of running this thing sees something in him when he talks to him and stands up for himself is like, look, I can help you. I care about this. I want to go. Um, I love Laszlo. Like everybody else, I, I am falling in love with his character. He's such a sweetie. And, you know, I'm, I like those intellectual type characters, you know? Whether they're the cranky ones or the, you know, the really sweet ones. Um, and we also get the story of the people that are trapped in the city of Weep, these children of gods, and we're getting their perspective, and they're very bitter and want revenge on humans. Um, and I don't know if they've explained why yet, but they, um, and they each have a special ability, and one of the oldest, who looks like a child still, wants, wants her siblings to use the powers to get revenge on all of humans. Particularly the the God Slayer, which I guess that's part of the reason like the God Slayer killed their parents or something. I like I said, there's some points where I'm missing stuff because I can't hear everything, and there's only so loud my volume can go on my phone. Um, so there are times when I'm missing when I'm missing beats and stuff. But like I said, I'm trying to get this done before the end of the week, but I only have three days left, so I'll have to listen to a lot. So not uh, this evening. But it's so far it's really good. I like the writing style, the beautiful descriptions and the magic the whimsy and everything of this world is really cool. Um so anyway, I I'm trying to decide what I'm gonna read after after I'm done filming this video. I don't know what I'm gonna go to yet. Um like NOS for A2, I feel like I need to read a little bit more of that. And then there is also David Copperfield. I want to read a little bit more of that as well. One of them I'll probably read in, in bed when I go to sleep tonight. And then I have to go back to work tomorrow. But I am off Wednesday and Thursday. So that will be nice. Um, and then I think I'm actually off. I'm trying to think of what other day. I'll, I don't remember what else, off the top of my head what other day. But I'm off a lot this week, which is good. And I, again, I have to remember not to all not to agree to work. Because my, you know, mom wants to be able to go to Virginia without risking her, without risking getting contact with the virus. Because we, we don't know when at my work. I'm not 100% sure, you know, if I'm coming to contact. Yeah, people are using their masks. Although apparently there are some people who are like, oh, I'm not worried about it. And I just keep thinking, well, okay then. If you're not worried because, you know, we do offer masks. The people that are cleaning, whoever is cleaning the carts, you're supposed to offer people masks if they forgot theirs or don't have one or something. Um, and, or if I haven't gone to that cart and they just grab it, you know, I'm like, okay, I haven't cleaned that one or do you want a mask? They're like, oh, I'm, you know, I don't need one. I'm not worried. It's like, okay, um, okay, well, I can't really force you, you know, I mean, so, and, I don't know. I don't know if that person is just taking this huge risk. Most people probably say yes. But it's not like you can, you know, and I'm a little thinking they're taking a risk, but, you know, there's a possibility that maybe they're not. I mean, a very slim possibility, but. So, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I'm glad I can check off the ebook on my list. Of, in my list of 
my list of books I've read. And I have to figure out what I'm going to read next. I do not know yet. Because I do want to read a book that I can get through. Not not like, I'm not talking about speeding through the book. But just a book that I know I can get through. Like The Magnificent Ambers Ambersons. I keep saying Umbersons or Ambersons. But it's Ambersons. Like Amber as in the, the golden sap stuff. But it's um. Anyway, so, um, I hope you all are doing okay. I hope everyone is, you know, everything is doing their part in this situation, this really bad situation they're in. Um, and if reading helps, at least on a personal level for you, to help, you know, then I hope you are able to read. And I will talk to you all later. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, click subscribe if you haven't already, and you're and click the bell notification below just if you want to see when I post new videos. And I guess I will talk to you all later. Alright, bye!